Hey guys, it's MJ, the student actuary, and today we're going to be talking about chapter 16 in CA1, which is property. So property is an asset class, and yeah, let's look what are we going to talk about with regards to property. Okay, we're going to look at first, what do we mean when we say a property is prime? Then we're going to look at the risk characteristics, we're going to compare freehold to leasehold, and finally, we're going to look at the advantages and disadvantages of investing in property indirectly. Okay, so prime property. This would be an example of a prime piece of property. Okay, um, it, it's easy to tell what is prime. I mean, it's, it's the location, it's the use of the building, it's what city it's in, all those type of things. But instead of us just trying to guess, we actually have written down a whole bunch of things. You can remember it by the acronym Wall Street. So its prime is whether it's comparable. So that's quite an interesting thing. I mean, if it's a house, houses are very comparable, offices are very comparable. But when you start going into industrial property, like if you've got a nuclear factory or a factory does something really weird, then it's not going to be very comparable, and that's not going to make it prime, or it's not going to fulfill this category. Another thing that makes property prime is its age and condition. Now, this is something we're not going to be seeing with the other, the other asset classes. You know, a bond that is old doesn't wear out, whereas a property that is old does start losing a little bit of its value. It needs maintenance and needs to be cleaned up every once in a while. Um, location, 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 and trying to determine what is a good location and what is a bad location is something very tricky to do. And knowing whether I'm paying, um, whether I'm getting this location for a good value or if I'm overpaying for it, that's very tricky to do. And that's what property managers spend a lot of their time on. The lease structure, yeah, that's like the lawyers and all of them. Um, the size, this is interesting. You'd think that the bigger is better. Not necessarily. A really big, big, massive house is much harder to sell than, let's say, a tiny apartment in Monaco. So they might be of the same value, um, especially if your house does not have location location. So you can see how they're all like interlinked. Uh, tenant quality, this is if you're renting your property, which is what you're basically going to be doing if you have property as an investment. Um, this is critical. I mean, if you've got a good tenant, then the rest actually don't even matter. If you've got a tenant who's paying you a good return, that's great. Then four additional ones I've written in red, and that is the type of property, the development potential, uh, facilities, you know, is it a, just a factory or does it have a little kitchen and a little bathroom and its adaptability. They aren't essential but if you get a question on property you can answer with the Wall Street uh, acronym and then you can always throw in these two or these four other ideas to get two extra marks. So yeah, that is prime property. I love property so I could talk forever on this stuff but let's move on. Because let's move on about property in general. Okay, in general, the the big risks with property, especially in my country, are political risks. You know, are there going to be land grabs? Is this land going to be allocated to another type of people group? Is are foreigners going to be banned from buying? Um, you know, all these these things. Property because it's so emotional, it becomes very political. But there's also the whole um, risk that you don't have a tenant and that your property stands empty and it starts deteriorating and it becomes a liability to you because you still have to pay um, rates and taxes and all of those type of things. And that's why it's quite weird when people, you know, back in the day, if something was very safe or very risk-free, they would use the, or the saying, safe as houses. And we know how incorrect that is today. So the yield, um, your yield is going to be a step income stream. What that means is in this year, rent will be 10 rand. In the next year, the rent will be 11 rand. The following year, it will be 12 rand. So it steps up. It doesn't go 
10 then 10 and 10 cents like a like an equity share or a bond might do it it steps up um, the running yield is between that of equities and bonds because you're still going to be getting um, you're going to be getting a much higher income than an equity but you're not going to have as much capital appreciation or you could you could i mean that's the thing about it's very difficult to say where each asset class falls in because there's so many different factors you have to consider um, the spread in the short term it's quite stable in the long term i said yeah it's quite volatile because of the whole fact of political city movements urban development all that type of stuff um, there isn't a term on property but it does become obsolete after so many years you know you have to rebuild or refurbish and you know this is just going to add to your expenses you might even need a management um, if you've got multiple properties just to take care about it and finally the big thing I want to talk about is marketability okay now you know that if you want to sell your stocks or you want to sell your bond you can do it that day if you want to sell your house it's going to take longer than a day it's going to take a few few weeks maybe even a few months and that is because property is unmarketable it's unmarketable because when you sell your shares let's say you sell a million worth of shares this person might buy 200 that person might buy 10 this person might buy 500 you know different people can buy different chunks of it when you sell a property you have to find a buyer who buys the entire thing unless you buy, find a group who buys but there is one party who purchases the whole building um, so it's, it's a large unit size it's indivisible and also each property is kind of unique. I mean, no two locations are exactly the same. They've got different coordinates. And and so that, you know, property is unique. So there's always that, well, what actually is this valuation? And valuation becomes subjective and it's a whole blah. But your yeah, marketability, it's, it's an interesting thing with regards to property. And later on, we're going to look at how, how to get around this hurdle. Okay, freehold and leasehold. Freehold basically means you're the absolute owner in perpetuity. You can let the property for an annual ground rent. Leasehold is a short term and provides a higher initial rental yield. However, then you get that capital loss um, if the lease is held to termination date. It's quite boring that stuff, so I don't want to talk too much about it. Um, but something that is more interesting is indirect property investment. So there's a company here in South Africa called Growth Point Properties. And what you can do with them is you can, they just like a share, like a company, you buy, buy equity within them. They take that money and they then buy property. So it seems like a pretty good idea, right? Well, let's check out the, the advantages and the disadvantages. So I'm going to start with the advantages. So the advantages is that you're going to be getting diversification. Okay, before I could only take, say, a million and buy one factory. Now I can give a million to growth points and they can get, I can have theoretically 10% in 10 different factories. Um, the fact that it shares, it becomes divisible uh, and because of that, it now becomes marketability because I can sell one share in growth point to somebody else. You know, it can, it's much easier to sell and to buy. Valuation is done a little bit better. It's still a tricky one to do, but the valuation, because it's on the stock market, so you've got, if it is incorrect, you know, you're hoping that the forces of supply and demand will even it out. Um, because these guys are experts, it's going to reduce the expenses and it's going to be less hard work for them because they're pooling everything together. Um, you might even be able to get the property at a discount to the net asset value. So let's say there's a recession or there's fear and everybody pulls their money out of the stock market for no proper reason. Then growth point will become quite cheap. And you could theoretically buy all these properties at a much lower value. Um, but another nice thing is that as an individual, I can't invest in a shopping center. Okay, I don't have enough money to buy in a shopping center. Or I've got here the picture of the... Is this what, what is this big building in Dubai? That really big one. Okay, no individual could buy this building. Okay, maybe Warren Buffett. But anyway, by coming into an indirect property company, together the company could buy 20% along with a whole bunch of other companies. And therefore, I'm getting a little bit of exposure to this awesome building. But there are some disadvantages. 
and that is you lose your control. So when you're buying property by yourself, you get to decide, I like this house, I'm gonna buy this house. You give your money to Growth Point and they can buy whatever they want. You have no control. You can be like, I don't like this neighbor, and they're like, tough luck. Um, personal gearing, I mean, that's one thing you can get the advantage when you buy property is you can buy a property, take a bond on it, buy another property and do all that gearing. You lose that ability when you go through indirect property investments. Um, and the reason being is the banks don't see it the same way. And that's because with indirect property investments, you're going to get a lot of correlation with equities, which is weird. You're going to be getting diversification within the asset class, but you're then going to lose your diversification among the asset classes if you're holding equities as well. Sometimes they might have to make four sales and there could be much more volatility and there could be some tax disadvantages. But yeah, that is property. And then another thing to always look at, uh, I'm not gonna talk about in this video though, are the economic influences on the property market. How do they affect the occupation market, the development cycles and the investment market? I've written some points down there, so feel free to read through them. But this is a fun chapter, so enjoy it. And um, yeah, maybe one day we'll all be rich and we'll be able to afford property of our own. But yeah, thanks for watching. Next up, I'm going to be doing futures and options. So subscribe if you haven't done so already. And I'll see you next time. Cheers.